Good afternoon, everyone. Forgive my giggle, but there are a few people in this temple who were being funny. So anyway, uh, I've had the great honor today of giving the first talk, and now I'll be giving this last talk of the afternoon. It's, uh, it's been interesting. I've been watching the whole day, which has really been special. Uh, any part of it that you missed, make a mental note to go back and uh, pick it up. Each segment has been very much what I said this morning. I said, I'm sure each segment will be full with the teachings, with the essence of what Paramahansa Yogananda came to show us. And in fact, that is exactly what has happened through video, through music, through talks, each one standing alone in a complete expression of Yogananda's teachings. Before I go on, I forgot I wanted to just mention, for any of you who would like to make a donation to Ananda Palo Alto, um, maybe do it in honor of this great celebration of the 100th, or just uh, to help sustain the uh, temple and its work, please go to the website anandapaloalto.org slash donate and the computer will happily take your donation for you. Um, what's been interesting for me all day, coming back to my talk now, is that I started out the morning with a talk about Kriya Yoga, and I spoke mostly about energy and transforming energy. And consistently throughout the day, each person that has spoken in their own way has come back to talk about energy. I mean, of course they would. It's absolutely the essence of this path. If you miss Sai Ganesh, when he talked just a bit ago, you listen to him once singing the battle hymn of the Republic and see if your energy doesn't change and isn't more uplifted. Master loved that piece and we could just sing it and march around the room to it. And you know what? We'd all be well. That's the title of this talk, how to be truly well. Or I was just listening to Helen talk about education for life. And she was talking about doing super conscious living exercises with the children to uh, raise and expand their energy and how much joy is consciously brought into the classroom so that energy changes, even without saying it to small, to small children. Now, I'm saying this to you because I am frequently asked to speak about how to be truly well. Uh, I spoke about it recently for Spiritual Renewal Week. I would say two years ago, I gave a several hour long class at Ananda LA that you can find on YouTube. Uh, it was a very good and comprehensive talk. This is much shorter. Um, and there's been a couple of other times. And that is logical, it makes sense. I'm a minister and I'm a physician. And I've been on this path for decades now, since 1979. So however many years that is, it's been a long time. So I have these teachings that inform everything I do. And of course, I have an interest in wellness. Uh, Swami Kriyananda says, wellness is a state of mind that must be cultivated. And it's interesting. He's saying this, and he says it in many talks. Just earlier today, I clicked on a very short talk that he gave on radiant well-being. And it's a beautiful little talk. It's like 15 minutes long. And he sort of coined that radiant well-being. But it's so beautiful. It has a crystal clear, the crystal clarity of what he's trying to say with radiant well-being just comes through the words. You hardly have to ask yourself, what did he mean? But when he was talking about it today, he was saying, Healing has to happen from the inside out, 
not from the outside in. And he said, Master never really spoke about, nor does he, specifically which diet you're going to be on or really how to heal this body, even with medicines or with procedures, not because they were opposed to it. They're not at all opposed to Western medicine and its interventions, quite the contrary. Master said many times, if you need a doctor, go. Swamiji himself spent a fair amount of time being helped through many physical ailments by Western medicine. But that's not what we mean by radiant health. And that's not what we mean by well-being. When we speak about these things, we are talking about what happens at the level of energy. There is no way to talk about this without talking about energy. And I know everybody's been doing that all day. I'm going to keep it brief. But we are all manifestations of pure energy. Again, we've spoken about it. We, uh, were, we go from the causal plane to the energetic plane to the material plane. We are a manifestation of energy. This has been proven now many times and in many ways. But uh, Curlian photography is the best way, and I've used this example many times. It's brief, so I'll use it again. If you take a picture through this method called Curlian uh, photography of a leaf, you see the leaf. If you cut the leaf and you take another picture, you still see the leaf because you've cut the leaf on the material or physical plane, but you haven't injured or changed the energy that was before that leaf was. It's energy that manifests in all of its physical form. So as I said when I gave my talk at SRW, but it's the truth, so it needs to be said again, healing has to happen by starting at, uh, at the material plane and backing up and finding that energetic place where we are perfectly well or influencing the energetic body. This is why all the forms of energy medicine or energy healing, and there's many of them, is so powerful. It's powerful because it's going right to the cause of the problem. Uh, Yogananda says um, in, his in his book, Scientific Healing Affirmations, he opens the book by saying, perfect health is given by God. Disease is man-made. And given by God means manifested as from that divine, perfect energy to this form. And then we are here on the physical plane, creating lots of problems is what we're doing in many ways, and getting ill in so many different ways. And it doesn't matter whether it's a medical problem or a psychiatric problem or a surgical problem. We have to take care of it. And I want to be very mindful to say this. Um, if you have um, appendicitis and you, you really should have your appendix removed, you're going to get into much more trouble if you don't. But as you're healing from that, it would be a very good idea to find somebody who can help you heal at that energetic level, who can really, whatever it is, um, whether it's color therapy or flower essence therapy, I mean, I could just go on and on, there's so, so much of it, uh, or a homeopathic remedy, all of these things are wonderful. And there's many conditions that they can treat in and of themselves because they're working at the level where the condition is. However, we can't be silly about it. You know, many of these things happen. They're so deep-seated, seated, S-E-A-T-E-D, -E in us, 
in our astral spine. It's like strong karma. I think of cancer that way, most cancers. Very big, strong karma. Now, I've, I know of miraculous cures. I've seen some of them myself. Um, but barring one of those miracles, most of the time, you have to hit that cancer or other big karmic issues with a force that's equal to them, that's stronger than them. So surgery, chemotherapy, whatever it is, people may well need that. But then to come in and treat the more subtle aspects as we're healing. So that again, we're treating the condition at the level that it happens. I'd like to share a story with you that I wanted to share for SRW and it left my mind. But it really speaks to what does it mean to be well and what is healing. Having been a physician for all of these years and having practiced medicine with Master Yogananda so close to me in that profession, I just always felt that he was with me constantly guiding me, which as you can imagine, has been a great joy. I have so many stories that are trying to make their way into a book and it might just happen. But one of the stories is that uh, right near the very beginning of my medical school, I had already been a nurse for 14 years and I had worked in intensive care units and coronary care units and emergency rooms all by way of saying I was very comfortable in, in hospital already. But it was my first couple of weeks of medical school. That was a little threatening. I was asked to go and see a woman on the cardiac unit who had been in for what's called congestive heart failure where your heart can't pump enough blood and the fluid backs up into your lungs and you can't breathe. She was sick. I'm just giving you enough information to know that. And on the way over, I was thinking, what am I going to offer? She's at Stanford University, where these teams of doctors come in all day, specialists and their whole team, the internists and their whole teams. Uh, you're seen by a lot of physicians there. Then I go to the nurse's station to find out her room. And they said, oh, Dr. Rubenstone, she is not going to be happy to see you. She's just, she's refusing visitors. She's just, she really wants to die, is what she wants. She was an older woman, I think in her 80s. But she could have been my age then, and it would have felt that much older to me, so who knows? <laughs> Maybe she was 73, but she, she looked old to me. Um, and I just thought, I have nothing to offer this woman. And then I said to myself, of course you do. Of course you do. And I walked into her room and I sat down on her bed and I just put my hand on her arm and I introduced myself. I asked her, I said, is it okay if I sit here? You know, are you okay if I touch you? I mean, it was very respectful. And then I just looked at her and I said to her, how are you? I mean, really, how are you? And she started to cry and then started to talk and she spoke for over an hour without stopping. We took up all of the time that I was supposed to be doing this history on her, a medical history, which is a long drawn out ordeal for medical students. Um, it was a beautiful hour. I never said anything. When I left, she was so grateful just to be heard and to be seen. You could see her opening you could feel her energy coming up. She was telling me about all of the loss in her life and about her loneliness. But as she was speaking about all of that, all of those feelings were being transformed. Like somebody's here and they care about me and they're listening to me. It was really a magnificent moment. That was in 1979, so here we are 40, 40 years later, and I, it could have been yesterday. I remember it. Anyway, the next day I go back to see her, 
And I walk into her room, and the bed's empty and stripped. And I just went, oh, I was so sure that she had died. She was just gone. I had just been with her. And I went to the nurse's station, and I said, what happened? And they said, she asked us to call her doctor. And when he came, she was strong. She was clear. She said to him, I want to leave. I'm ready to go home. Just like that. I mean, it spun everybody around. And they said she left. And he said, well, we don't think you're ready. She said, I do. And he said, you'll have to sign out AMA, which means against medical advice. And she said, fine, show me where to sign. It's a true story. She left. She wound up dying maybe six or seven months later. But I was in touch with her. That is a perfect example of being truly well. Nothing changed on the physical level for her, really. We didn't treat her congestive heart failure or her, her many of her other medical issues. But she was well. It's an attitude. It's a way of thinking. It's what we need to do, each of us, to get ourselves into that place where we see things so differently than the vast majority of people do, where we're able to look at what most people would consider to be a horrible problem, but to see in a more expansive way the ways it can be serving us, the ways we can transcend it. That's what wellness is. It's not at this level. You know, there are people in wheelchairs for the rest of their life who are joyful and who help other people feel joyful, who do competitive sports. I mean, so many things. Helen Keller was the first time that I ran into that in a, a, in a big way. You know, she was deaf and she was blind and she wrote a diary and just filled with joy. And then how many people do we know who are really perfectly healthy and who can walk and who can see and who can hear, but they're not well. They're literally not well. They make themselves sick in a certain way. So wellness is about energy. And as I've listened today to all of these talks, I realize wellness is our whole path. It's everything that we have been able to absorb from Yogananda and Swamiji and others. It's about how we carry ourselves in the world, not what we're carrying, remembering again that we have to treat things the way we have to uh, treat them. Wellness actually begins in both the brain, but also in this astral spine once again. And when you listen to Swamiji's talks, you hear him. I'm just looking to say, oh, to read some of what else he said, because it was so clear. He talked at one point a lot about affirmations probably many who are watching this have done affirmations. Affirmations are statements of our highest potential. So the affirmation for good health starts, I am strong, I am well. Now it starts, my body cells obey my will. My body cells obey my will. I am strong, I am well. It goes on, and it's beautiful how it ends, and maybe we'll get back there. But just saying that, if you're lying in bed and you're not feeling well, you repeat that, my body cells obey my will. I am well, I am strong, or strong and well, whichever way it is, it doesn't matter. There's so much power in that. It becomes transforming. You know, not that long ago, Suryani was here. She led us through super conscious living exercises. I am awake and ready. 
I am positive, energetic, enthusiastic, because those are affirmations. You may not be feeling positive, energetic, and enthusiastic, but just try doing that affirmation for a while and see if you don't feel better. And if you don't feel better right away, keep doing it. Because this affirmation knows the power of words and the power of thoughts. And as Swamiji says, the old saying used to be, we are what we eat. He says, that's not true. We are what we think. So what we need to do with affirmations and with how we approach the rest of these teachings is we literally need to change our mind. We have to if we're ill or if we've been hurt. If we change our mind and we have not just a positive attitude, but a powerful, forceful, clear, in the right direction, if we are saying, yes, I can, I will, those are the things that help us be well. Instead of what we see so often when we're watching people say, well, I don't know, I'm not sure, maybe, I don't know, I don't know, let me, let me think about it. You can feel that such different energy. That is not healing energy. That's the kind of energy where, we're, where we talk about when we're pulling in two directions away from each other. It's like two people pulling opposite directions, but you get those same two people on the same side of anything pulling in the same direction, and it brings a lot of force and a lot of power. We have to get out of our own way. Again, we're talking about spiritual wellness. But if we can learn to do that, if we can bring our mind to a different place, if we can hold ourselves at our very center and work energetically to have more control over our energy. You know, Master brought these energization exercises, many of you know them, I imagine. For those of you who don't, um, there are a series of 39 exercises that help us draw energy in or focus the energy that we are and put it in a certain place. So we squeeze the uh, bicep until it trembles and then we relax and we feel the energy flow. We, we squeeze a part of our leg. This is what the uh, exercises do. They take us through our whole body, not because we're trying to develop muscle in the body, but because so brilliantly, Master was saying to us, if you learn how to get control of that energy, if you learn first to believe that you can access all of this energy, all of the energy that you are, that you're surrounded with, even a part of it. He said one gram of our flesh could light the, take care of all of the energy needs in Chicago, the entire city, for a week, I think he said. That's huge. We have so much more energy than we know. We have access to infinite energy. And he comes along and he gives us a way to learn how to place it precisely where we want it. Now I need it here. Now I need my energy here. Now I need to do this. I need to become positive, energetic, and enthusiastic. I can't be walking around saying maybe, or I don't know. No, not when things matter. Even if we say, you know what? That's either a great idea or I'm not sure, but I will think about it. That is much more energy. And I'm not, <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, this could sound very off topic, but it's exactly on topic. It's taking energy and it's focusing it and it's being positive and it's keeping our thoughts in the right place because that influences everything. And it's getting all of our energy flowing in one direction, which is in and up always. It's doing all of those things to take us into what we're calling here 
truly well or radiant health and well-being. It's all the same. These bodies are beautiful vehicles. We need them. We need a way for our soul to move around life after life while it's making progress. But our main goal in life is not to simply focus on this body. It needs good food. It needs exercise. We need to pay attention. We want a good vehicle that's respectful. We even have a responsibility. But we can't get confused. If we get confused and think that's what's important, it, it won't help us. We can't take it with us. We, we, anything could happen to it. But if we understand that we're keeping it well so that the soul has a great vehicle in this life so that it can continue on its journey towards ultimately being truly well, which would mean one with the divine, ultimately finding true radiant health, one with God, then we're 